So thank you very much for the introduction. And today I will talk about my PhD research, which is about cross-domain egocentric action recognition. So first of all, I will show you this video of uh, a dataset from an egocentric uh, uh, footage. So you can see the person is uh, moving around the kitchen. And here is some other examples of uh, the setting. So the camera in egocentric vision is mounted on the head of the wearer and the wearer is, the, is recording uh, his activities. So here you can see different activities such as uh, cutting bell pepper or washing glass. And the characteristics of egocentric vision is that uh, you can visualize all the objects that the user is interacting with. And this allows to study many more um, fields, for example, skill understanding or recognizing uh, um, the procedures that the uh, user is taking. And um, the question is why it is important to uh, do egocentric vision and to study this topic. My favorite argument is that uh, nowadays we have our hands occupied all the time while we, while we travel, while we cycle, and even when we go to bed. And uh, in the future, if uh, we have some wearable devices available that can understand what's happening ar around us, we will be able to have our hands free again. And uh, if you want to be even more convinced that this is an interesting topic, you can check out uh, our survey on egocentric vision, where we show different use cases in which uh, smart glasses will be available in the future. For example, here is uh, an example of police, a policeman that is uh, uh, using wearable devices to navigate uh, through uh, a map. And uh, there is a problem in uh, egocentric vision and uh, in videos in general, which is called environmental shift. So here you can see the same action performed in different environments. The action is cutting, but the environment is so difficult that for the network, it is very hard to understand what is happening in one environment if it has been trained on a different one. And this is called domain shift. So we have a source distribution, which is the one we are training on, and we have a target distribution, which is the one we are testing on. And the model struggles in recognizing the same action across different domains. There are different types of domain shift. We also have the viewpoint shift, so video captured from uh, a third person point of view and videos captured from an egocentric point of view. Or we can also have an actor shift. So here is the same action, but performed from different actors. And this uh, might introduce some problematics when training neural networks. And today I will uh, focus on this problem, the domain shift problem, and I will present two works that uh, I uh, did during my PhD. The first one explores generalization across scenarios and locations, and the second one introduces a new modality for uh, studying um, the problem of cross-domain actual recognition. So you can all recognize uh, uh, what's happening here. So in these three uh, videos, the person is doing the same action, which is cutting. And in the first case, uh, it is a chef cutting a carrot with a knife. In the second case, uh, it is a mechanic cutting metal with an angle with, um, with um, pliers. And in the third case, uh, it is a construction worker cutting metal with an angle grinder. So the instruments used to perform the actions are very different, and this can be the case also when cutting paper with scissors or pruning herbs with shears. We can even cut with our hands. And um, the diversity on the instruments used and on the scenario in which the activities happen um, um, represent a new kind of domain shift, which in this case we call scenario shift, and that has been never studied before. Studied before. There is also another domain shift, which is uh, the geographical location shift. So here you can see the same action performed in different geographical locations. You can see someone cutting in Italy, someone cutting in uh, Africa, and someone cutting in India. And uh, because of the geographical diversity, um, there is a domain shift, which is called location shift, that impacts on the way the actions are performed. And uh, in this work, we want to introduce a new data set to perform action recognition generalization over scenarios and location. We start by with Ego4D, which is a large scale data set in egocentric vision. We select 13, 13 different locations and 10 different scenarios. 
in which activities are performed, which uh, uh, represent 60 different action classes. Here you can see cut, take or throw, for example. And uh, in total, this data set contains uh, 1.1 million samples, which makes it the largest data set for uh, studying this problem so far. And uh, how do we study this problem? We start from the ARG1 data set and we want to study a generalization problem. So we take one uh, scenario and one location, for example, cooking in Japan. And we take the intersection, so all the examples that are recorded in a, in a cooking activity in Japan as a, train, a test set. And we remove all these samples that contain either cooking or either Japan from the training set because we want to generalize to um, those samples. We want it to be unseen during training in a way that the network is able to generalize to some scenarios or some locations that have not been seen during training. And uh, with uh, this proce with procedure, we also um, obtain other different uh, 10 uh, splits, which uh, uh, are derived from a combination of a different scenario and a different location. So we also want to propose a method to, um, to basically address this domain shift. And the way we do that is by using text, because uh, text contains uh, rich semantic information about the action that is happening in the video. So for example, here is someone cutting the lemon strand. And instead of using the video itself, we uh, use a reconstruction that uh, is being aligned to the text narration. This is because uh, we can represent each video as a combination of uh, actions or videos from different scenarios or different location. For example, here you can see the original video of someone cutting the lemon strand that can, can be represented or can find some similarities from other videos of, of uh, someone picking a lemon from a tray where the fruit is present or someone chopping the fruit with a knife where also the same signal is present or other videos from different scenarios and location where we can find some shared semantics with the video we're reconstructing. And um, the architecture is very simple. So we have an input video and uh, the corresponding text narration, and we feed both the video and the text to two different feature extractors so to obtain some visual features and the textual features. And the visual features, which are the ones on top, are the ones using for action classification. So the goal is to classify the action. And then we have uh, um, other videos that uh, are in the batch that uh, are from different scenarios or different locations, and we call support set. And for each of them, we extract a query and a key embedding. And we compute basically the dot product between those. So we obtain some weights, and those, those weights are used to reweight the original video and to obtain a reconstruction of uh, the video itself. And this reconstruction is used to train a video text association loss. So this is a simple contrastive loss which aims to align the visual representation with the textual representation. The objective is to backpropagate this information to the feature extractor in a way that at test time, we only need F, the feature extractor, to learn a representation which is general enough to perform well on different scenarios or different locations. We also introduce a second cross-instance reconstruction. This time, the reconstruction is obtained through a standard cross uh, product attention. And uh, this second reconstruction, this time, is uh, trained with a simple classifier, which is the same that is used for training. And uh, um, during test time, we don't need text information, and uh, we just use the visual information and our trained feature extractor to perform our action classification task. Here are uh, different examples that we obtain. So on the top left, you can see the query video. And uh, on the bottom, you can see the top five videos which uh, were used for the reconstruction from the support set. And uh, you can see, um, for example, here is someone dropping the palm front. And you can see on the bottom if uh, it, it works. Okay. 
ignore. Okay, you can see on the bottom that uh, the videos that we reconstructed from come from different scenarios and from different locations, but still contain the same semantics. And the same happens here with someone touching cloth, where we can find reconstructions from different videos, from different locations, and from different scenarios. And for the results, we compared uh, with a baseline, ERM, which is standard training on uh, our training set and testing on uh, our target distribution without adaptation strategies. And uh, we compare with other six domain generalization methods and show that uh, our uh, proposed uh, cross-instance reconstruction method achieves better performance than all the previous method. And uh, the paper has been published to a conference last year and it is available online. So you can also check out the code and download the dataset if you want to use it. And uh, Let's go back to our environmental shift. So let's go back uh, on the fact that if we train on one uh, domain, on one environment and test on another one, uh, this, uh, origin, this uh, uh, creates some environmental shift. And uh, to assess the, um, how strong is domain shift, we, tra we, we train on a training domain and we assess the accuracy uh, performance on the same uh, domain, which is uh, seen in blue in this case, which is seen domain, and uh, on uh, a different domain from the one from we are training on, which is uh, uh, performance on unseen domains. And you can see there is a strong up in performance, which is around 15%. And this shows uh, that uh, this problem is, uh, uh, is very big in the context of uh, egocentric vision. What's interesting is that uh, when we use uh, different modalities, uh, for example, RGB information, we achieve 37% perf of perf performance. When we test on optical flow information, which encodes the motion in the scene, we achieve 47%. And uh, what's interesting is when we combine the two, so RGB and optical flow information, performance even decreases uh, with respect to the one obtained uh, with optical flow alone. And this shows that different modalities uh, suffer in different ways from the domain shift. And when we combine them, it seems that one affects the other. And this is because uh, when uh, we look at the different modalities, RGB features focus on appearance information, which is very domain specific because uh, the color of the kitchen, for example, the color of the, the, the wall, depends on the environment uh, in which we are performing the activities. While on the other side, when we consider motion information, this purely encodes the motion of the ends performing the action. So we call it a domain agnostic modality because it does not depend on the environment. And this is because it performs very well. But uh, there is a problem. So it is very slow to compute motion information because you need to process all the RGB video in order to obtain uh, this new modality. So in this work, we introduce uh, a new uh, device that can be used uh, in the context of egocentric vision to improve performance across domains. And this is event-based cameras. So basically event-based cameras acquire the input in the same way we acquire basically visual information around us, which is through light, light brightness changes. So what does this mean? Standard cameras represent a video as a sequence of images at fixed points in time, and they basically combine this sequence to create the video. But this is not the true way we perform the reality, because the way we perform the reality is through brightness changes. To show you an example, this is a person moving, and is, as the person is moving, the light reflects on his body in different ways. And uh, as you can see, in correspondence to the parts uh, where the, there is more motion, we can have uh, these uh, um, blue dots, which are events. And this is what event-based cameras produce. So in correspondence to light changes, they produce uh, an event which represents a change in terms of brightness. And what's interesting is that they only encode uh, this information when the person is moving, but when the person is standing, uh, 
um, you can see that uh, no event information is encoded. So now we're standing, for example, and you can see that less events are produced. And uh, these uh, sensors basically encodes only the motion in the scene, was uh, introduced in 2008 uh, in Zurich in, at ATH University. And um, it operates at a very low latency. So for example, one around the one microseconds, it doesn't suffer from motion blur and it can operate at high, very high dynamic range. So it's 140 decibel instead of the 60, which are from standard cameras. And uh, it has a very low power because uh, it doesn't encode all the frames. It just encodes the parts of the scene that are moving. So it operates at one milliwatt. Um, which is compared with one watt from standard cameras. And on the bottom, you can see an example of uh, um, an output of a standard camera and the output of uh, an event-based cameras, which is basically a stream of events. So to give you a more uh, mathematical formulation, we can represent an event as uh, some pixel coordinates at which an event is happening, X and Y a timestamp, which, which represents the time at which uh, this event is happening, and a polarity, which represents whether the change in terms of brightness was positive, so a brightness increase, or it was negative, so a brightness decrease. And uh, the idea of this work is to extend Epic Kitchens, which is the most co popular data set in egocentric vision with the event modality. So here on the right, you can see a representation of the event stream. And uh, as you can see, it's very similar to representation obtained from optical flow. It encodes motion information. It is available at, at real time because it, it is produced directly from the device. And uh, it allows for very low power consumption. So it is ideal for this context. So the point is, uh, how do we process this kind of information with standard convolutional neural networks? So on the left, you can see some different temporal windows of the event stream and the way the representation, the dense representation on the right uh, is obtained is by discretizing basically the temporal stream on different windows and then flattening all the information on one frame. So, so you basically sum over all the polarities, all the events that are happening in that uh, sequence. And you obtain the representation on the right. And uh, in this paper, we focus on comparing this representation, so this new modality, with standard RGB information and optical flow information. And we do that on three different domains, so three different kitchens in uh, this data set, in order to be able to assess performance across different environments. So assessing what's happening when we train in one environment and we test on another. So to tackle this problem, we uh, made an observation, which is uh, RGB information on the channel dimension purely encodes static information about colors and intensities, while event-based data on the channel dimension encode some dynamic aspect. So basically, when we obtain um, a frame-based representation from each uh, sequence in the event stream, we concatenate all the representation on the channel dimension. And as a consequence, each channel represents a, a different temporal window inside the video. So we want to use this observation to increase the performance for modeling event-based information. And uh, we want to do a sort of uh, attention between the different channels in, moder in order to give more importance to some channels and less importance to others, and in order to um, focus more on important uh, signals of motion. We do it in 2D by proposing Ego 2D. And the way we do it that we have an input features and uh, we squeeze the input feature uh, by obtaining uh, a one by one by number of features uh, dimension. And uh, we basically learn a weight for each of these uh, channels, which is called excitation phase. And we use those weights to rescale our original features. So as a result, we will have some channels that have an higher weight than others. 
and that means they are more important in encoding motion information. And uh, we also propose uh, an, an approach that achieves the same, but in the 3D dimension, which is called Ego 3D. Basically, we perform 3D convolution, not only over the different time frames, but also across the different channels. So in this way, we can learn through a 3D convolution all the different relations. And we show performance on both uh, seen domains, so when training on one domain and testing on the same, and unseen domains. So that means we are training on one domain and testing on another. For example, D1, D2 means we are training on domain one and testing on D2. And uh, it's interesting to see the performance on unseen domains because uh, we can see that even base data alone perform better than RGB information. So even if they don't encode all the appearance information, they are still able to recognize the actions pretty well. And of course, the performance of on unseen domains are lower than the one on scene. And as you can see, uh, there is a huge gap. And uh, what also, what's, what's also interesting is that uh, when we use uh, the Ego 2D and Ego 3D approaches to encode the channel attention, results increase. And uh, when we uh, ask ourselves whether these results are good, we compare with a recent data set, which is uh, the event-based extension of uh, ImageNet, and it's called an ImageNet. And in this paper, they show that uh, even based data with respect to RGB information um, perform way less. So event-based data perform uh, achieve 48% in terms of accuracy, and uh, RGB data uh, achieve 90%. So you can see that uh, in the in this field, the um, the performance of event-based information is still far from the one of uh, RGB. While in our case, uh, we can show that uh, event-based data perform even better than RGB. And uh, we also introduce a new strategy so to further learning better features from uh, optical flow. And the idea is that we distill from optical flow features during training, and uh, we avoid the expensive computation of flow, of flow at test time. So at test time, we just use uh, the event stream, which has been distilled from the optical flow stream. And uh, we compare with the performance of uh, distilling with uh, uh, distilling RGB from optical flow, which is RGB plus LDIST. And uh, we can see that uh, when we distill event based data from optical flow, we obtain uh, 5.3 5, 5 improvement that is way more than the improvement obtained by distilling uh, from RGB to optical flow. And uh, what's also interesting is that if we compare the performance of event based data alone, which is 58%, those are almost on pair with the ones obtained by the combination of RGB plus optical flow. So by just using the event device, we can obtain the same performance as the ones combining two different modalities. And uh, what's, even, what's even more interesting is that uh, on unseen domains, so when we train on one environment and test on another, the performance of event based data are basically the same of uh, using RGB and optical flow information. So we also provide uh, an analysis of uh, the time complexity. We can show, we can see on the X dimension, the time to compute the difference data, and uh, on the Y dimension, the accuracy achieved. And uh, we assess the performance on both uh, seen and unseen domains. And uh, what we can see is that on seen domains, which is the one on top, even based data still performs a bit low, a bit worse than RGB information. And this is because in scene environments, so when we train and test on the same environment, of course, RGB information is important because it provides, for example, for objects, more detailed features. But when we focus on performance on unseen domains, even based data perform way better than RGB. And uh, we also compare with the performance uh, obtained by optical flow estimated through a very accurate algorithm, which is TV, TVL1, which is the, currently the best to perform, to basically achieve, uh, compute optical flow. But you can see that uh, it takes a lot of time to compute this kind of information, which is 500 milliseconds. 
which is way far from its applicability at real time. Even base data performs a bit lower, but they're still applicable, applicable real time. And what's interesting is that if we compare the performance of even data with another kind of optical flow, which is estimated through a learned network, which is PwC net, the performance of event are better than the ones of optical flow on both unseen and seen domains. So also this data set is available at uh, this uh, GitHub page. So if you want to use this data, you can download it and use the code and, and models. So as a conclusion, and I give you some takeaway and next steps. So I think egocentric vision is a very cool topic. And nowadays, many big companies are trying to uh, develop new devices, smart glasses that allow to achieve egocentric vision. And uh, in this field, uh, one main problem is generalization. And uh, I think it's still underexplored. So there are very many, many possibilities to analyze this uh, problem. And a possible direction, as I have shown to you, is focusing more on uh, motion modeling inside the uh, uh, videos rather than appearance information. And even base data provides a good generalization at sensor level, so um, represent a good solution to this problem. As uh, new directions in egocentric vision, I think it's interesting to combine uh, 2D observation, which are the frames from egocentric videos, with uh, 3D understanding. So here is uh, an example of a new data set which has been recently released. So you can see the reconstruction of the environment in which the activities are recorded. And uh, on the bottom, you can see um, the partial observations uh, taken from the camera. So one could uh, match the partial observation obtained from the device uh, with a complete observation of the 3D environment. And I want to thank all my collaborators in Turin and uh, in Politecnico di Milan, which is where I did my master, and from University of Bristol, which I had the chance to collaborate with uh, during my PhD. Thank you very much. And if you have any question, I'll be here to answer.